Hello, welcome back to ITC Sport. I am the Irish guy, and yeah, Premier League game week 15 is over and done with. So, um, let's just see what happened this weekend. Right, let's go. West Ham 3, Chelsea 2. Yeah, this. This is the moment. This is the moment where footballers once again turned on Jorginho. This is a midfielder who has turned his career around from getting booed off the pitch on Enrico Sarri, from being compared to a wet salmon by Chelsea fans, from Rio Ferdinand hinting that this man was just a fat Steve Siddall from Brazil, the guy who has since rebuilt his career to go out and win the Champions League and Euro 2020. But the worst thing he could have done to his reputation was to dare to nearly win the Ballon d'Or. I'm sorry, this man now officially bears the weight of being the third best footballer footballer on the planet, apparently. And so obviously people are now going to whine about that, doing their best to convince themselves that he's about as athletic as a melting snowman. That you'd sooner trust David Cameron to maybe set a pig than stick this man in your midfield, right? But uh, listen, I know he cost the club a goal against Man United last week. Honestly, that first touch made him look like a middle-aged bookworm with arthritis in his feet. But still, now, after a pretty lifeless and limp display at West Ham, this easy target is suddenly Chelsea's answer to Fred. Someone who apparently has the natural footballing ability of a chunky Charlie Adam, right? I'm really forgetting, this man is playing with a pain in his hip. Yes, I realize that makes him sound like a 93-year-old woman with bladder issues, but still, don't suddenly turn on the man. He's a European champion. This guy should be held up as a modern-day Chelsea legend. I mean, the Ballon d'Or might have just crushed Edward Mendy's confidence into the size of a melted Kit Kat. Honestly, this man who just finished runner-up in the Levy Ashton Award to Gianluigi Donnarumma. I mean, as soon as the Italian was announced as the winner, I'm guessing Mendy felt like shoving a flower pot down his throat. Yes, Donnarumma was utterly brilliant for Italy in the summer, but I'm sorry, this guy his job description just consists of sitting on the bench for PSG. I'm guessing losing the goalkeeping award to him, somebody who gets mostly ignored by Mauricio Pochettino. Oh, then I'm guessing that Mendy's self-esteem is currently stuffed at the bottom of a prison toilet bowl. Oh wait, that's the other Mendy. But that's the only explanation I can have for this wretched Kepa-esque performance at West Ham. Honestly, Mendy has been mostly flawless since arriving at Chelsea. But here, Mendy showed the decision making of a baby ghost. Listen, don't get me wrong, this is a pretty pulsating London derby. But Chelsea were only sloppy in the second half. And with three minutes to go, Arthur Masuaku chucks in a deflected cross that somehow, someone manages to evade Mendy and wind up in the top corner of the net. Listen, I know that deflections are sometimes tough to judge. But Mendy, in that moment, you look like a flat-footed Swan, showing the wrist strength of a rubber duck. But lads, the year is 2021 and David Moyes has just defeated the champions of Europe. Imagine predicting that back when you look at like football's answer to a walking pterodactyl when you've stuffed at the foot of the Premier League with Sunderland spending his weekends trying to coach a walking meatloaf like Duncan Watmore on the wing. I mean, Manchester United fans, they all think that Moyes is a dried up fig roll of a coach. Well, guess what lads? When was the last time that Manchester United beat the reigning champions of Europe? I'll tell you when, October 2012. At 3-2 in a Stamford Bridge, where Chelsea wound up with nine players on the pitch. That was nearly 10 years ago. What Moyes has done with his team is ridiculous. I mean, Jared Bowen won at Hull. He could very easily have turned into the next Jordan Rhodes, just utterly drowning like a diabetic goldfish as a center forward in the top flight. But no, instead, he's turned into an energetic workhorse on the wing. You know, the modern day Craig Bellamy. Well, a, a nicer C Craig Bellamy. I mean, this one doesn't look like he'd gladly bite the head off a kitten before clocking his mom in the face with a golf club when she undercooks the chicken Kiev. But Ozzy, David Moyes, well done. Newcastle won Burnley nil. All right then. So where is everyone who said that Newcastle were already confirmed as being relegated? Yes, Roy Jennings, I'm looking at you. Apparently, there was no chance in doggy heaven that this anyhow flavored lump of expired shreddies of a football team would survive in this division, right? Well, guess what, lads? In the space of three days, they've gone from being apparently the worst Premier League team of all time, so far cut adrift of safety, to now just three points, one win away from 17th. I'm sorry, but a Newcastle team brimming with unlimited funds in January. I'm guessing their relegation rivals are now probably crying into their morning porridge. This was Sean Dyche's big chance. Travel to Newcastle and almost send this the richest club of the world to the drop. I mean, can you imagine the Geordie reaction sitting in the December freezing cold? If, after bottling a must-win game against Norwich, to then take zero points from Burnley at home, watching some average dustbin mustard player like Dwight McNeil wheel away with a winning goal, the boost would deafen the entire city. Chris, of the clouds in the sky would probably turn black. Angry Geordies would probably spend the next month shouting abuse at House family as he tried to tuck into a chicken katsu at the back of Wagamama's. A loss here would have broken Newcastle's brain. Christ above, and would have probably drowned deck in a bath out of sheer desperation and rage. This was Burnley's big chance and yet they show the attacking ambition of a walnut. I'm sorry, aside from just 9,000 Geordies who got to witness that thrilling 1-0 win versus Sheffield United in May, then the Newcastle fans hadn't witnessed their club win a home match live in the flesh at St. James's Park since a last minute win over Chelsea nearly two years ago. 
Crazewell winning was on the goddamn pitch. Crazewell, this will put it into context. The second last win Newcastle fans watched at this ground coincided with Miguel Almiron's first goal for the club. And lads, that man's already three years into a five-year contract. It's been a long time! Christ with every Geordie inside that ground will bear the same facial expression as my middle-aged cousin, who hasn't so much as shook a woman's hand since 1996. But listen, great scrappy win for Newcastle, with Callum Wilson smacking home the only goal into the roof of the net. This event was one of the most enviable jobs in Premier League football. Living off other scraps, isolated up front for a cottage pie, stale scrambled egg of a football team. This man who turned down Aston Villa and served some Jack Grealish two years ago to instead spend every Saturday Afternoon, begging John Joe Shelby for a pass. I mean, yes, he always looked like a lovable, smiley Craig David looking like while at Bournemouth. Just, just a nice guy. But I guarantee you, after two years of this dross, being starved of actual service and assists, that when he drives into the club car park for training, he probably has to stop himself from backing over Shaw Longstaff's legs. Callum Wilson signing for Newcastle with this lack of service. It's like Jonah Hill spending the evening at a restaurant only for his waitress to spend 40 minutes sitting on the toilet playing TikTok. I mean, by the end of a hungry, hungry night, waiting three hours to get a plate of garlic bread, then in his blind desperation, the fat one from Superbad will probably decide to eat a dead rat on his way home. But despite this, 18 goals in 37 Premier League games for Newcastle. If he stayed fit, this man would practically be a 20 goal a season striker. But how? This almost defies logic. This man's got a better striker than Ollie Watkins. Get him in the England squad! Wolves nil, Liverpool won. What is a cult hero? Usually a pretty match pudding footballer who supporters still love anyway. Like how Champions League winning left back Jimmy Chayore is probably guaranteed a free pint of Liverpool until the day he dies, despite being about as defensively sound as a burnt egg. Honestly, there were some times watching him play football where I wouldn't have been surprised if you told me that he was blind to both eyes. But I'm sorry, there is no bigger cult hero in Liverpool's history than Divock Origi. This man has been a Liverpool employee for seven and a half years. Th that is meant to what he was alone at Lille. He was named in the league on worst team of the season after going on a 20 game goal drought. You'd assume this man was a 10 million pound Anfield flop. Y you know, the Belgian Balotelli. Someone not fit to clean the boots of Daniel Sturridge with his tongue. No, no, he has had the cult hero career that Ricky Lambert could only dream about. If you told someone then that this walking breadstick would still be on the Liverpool payroll in 2021 after nearly 40 goals for the club, having won the Premier League, Champions League, UEFA Super Cup and FIFA Club World Cup, uh, just, just, just what? Think how many incredible moments moments Origi has given to the Liverpool fans. The 96 minute winning goal in the derby would have been enough. A last minute derby winner Christ up making Jordan Pickford look like Derby the house elf. That would have been enough. He'd be what Michael Owen is to Man United but no. Not only that. There was a 96th minute equaliser against West Brom to scrap a draw in 2016. You know, the game where Jurgen Klopp did that handshake cuddle with the fans. What about his first goal in a 4 0 home win over Everton in April 2016? Or breaking the deadlock in the 75th minute against Sunderland at home? There was another Derby goal in a 3 1 home win over Everton in 2017. An 86th minute winning goal at Newcastle to keep their title hopes alive in 2019. Two goals in a 4 0 Champions League semi final win over Barcelona. A goal in an actual Champions League final against Tottenham and a fourth goal in a 5-2 demolition job of Everton and now this? How many times have Liverpool fans gone wild to an Origi goal? Crazy well, give it 10 years and there'll be at least three Scouse children in every primary school classroom on Merseyside called Divock. This is a man who Fulham tried to buy when Claudio Ranieri was the coach. And according to the Athletic, Liverpool had already agreed to sell him to Wolves for £22 million in 2018 only to see him reject the move. So imagine how pig sick the Wolves fans must feel watching their former target score that 94th minute winning goal. Ozzy, Divock Origi, no, never does he moan about spending nearly every week rotting on the bench like an expired Halloween pumpkin. No, it's official. This man has a greater liberal legacy than Michael Owen. And who else? I mean, did Robbie Fowler ever score in a Champions League final? Liberal fans are actually going to speak the name Divock Origi in 50 years time. That, that is mental. To any liberal fan who wants this man sold in the summer, Ozzy, shove a toothbrush up your nose. This man is the dream substitute. You should be praying this man agrees to sit on your bench until he's 40 years of age. Sell him to one bright one. Ow. How do I keep guessing Brighton scores correctly? This is actually beginning to scare me now. But well, that's Brighton. Neil Morpé has once again rescued you a late, late point. But do you know what that means? Zero wins in 10 games. That is over a quarter of the season without flushing out a single victory. And yet you're still in the top half. How? Actually.
literally how? Honestly, does somebody want to explain to me how Brighton can go three months without a win and still sit pretty in the top half of the Premier League? It makes no sense. Watford won Man City 3. Again, this is just utterly predictable. Man City once again flattening Watford like an eggy pancake. Listen, I've heard some utter wet nonsense surrounding Raheem Sterling, but he's all pace with zero finishing ability. I've heard some people even compare him to Daniel James. Okay then, let's just ignore the fact that he's just one goal away from joining the 100 goal club in the Premier League. And he's still only 26 years old. The way people speak about him, he's where he's a modern day Aaron Lennon. Some unfit former QPR cheese puff who's got the finishing instincts of a fat Jermaine Pennant. You know, the modern day Sean Wright Phillips. Okay, okay, let, let's just ignore the fact that he's just five goals short of Didier Drogba's tally in the Premier League. This is a man with more Premier League goals than Ruth Van Nistelrooy. And yet you want to pretend that he's just some wet muffin of a finisher? Nonsense! And again, yeah, he scored away at Wofford. And Bernardo Silva chipped in with two brilliant goals. I mean, if Mo Salah didn't exist, then this man would be a shoe in for the PFA Player of the Year, but uh, yeah, sorry Bernardo, you're just gonna have to hope that Mo Salah cracks his ankle like a twig at the Liverpool Christmas party. Leeds versus Brentford. Well, that's Ah, oh, Leeds fans are not gonna like this, but I'm looking at a shocked Brentford win. But honestly, I think a free-spirited, ambitious Brentford will smell a foul stench of second season syndrome. I'd imagine there's a similar odor to your granny's nursing home. And yeah, Ivan Tony and Brian and Bemo will smack in a couple of second half goals to seal a comeback 2-1 win. <sighs> I was so close, so close to being proven right. But who spoils it? Who spoils a quite brilliant prediction? Oh, that's right, the same spotty face violin as tattooed on my foot. I didn't even realize Paddy Bamford was back from injury. I thought I thought he still uh, had a thigh that looked like a baked casserole, but no, 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 he's back. Listen, Tyler Roberts stuck leads one up before Shannon Baptiste and Sergi Cano scored second half goals to swing the game around. Okay, I got the goal scorers wrong, but that's how he said it would go. That it would be a, a comeback 2-1 Brentford win. And yet yeah, then Bamford decides to crawl out of a wheelchair to sniff out a 95th minute equalizer with his thigh. Great. Thanks, Paddy B. Listen, any result on the road is a positive one for Brentford, but lads, Leeds, scrapping a last minute draw against a newly promoted club. I'm guessing those Leeds fans probably all left a sweaty patch on their seat. This is a set of fan base who've been utterly demoralized for years. But make no mistake about it, Leeds United are in a relegation scrap. And if they wind up relegated, Marcelo Bielsa will clearly leave his post, forcing you to offer the gig to, uh, Christ, well, Lee Boyer or Jonathan Woodgate. Yeah, sounds about as much fun as drinking breast milk out of a female horse. Christ, well, it is imperative Leeds don't go down, but lads, oh, their signs don't look good. Tottenham 3, Norwich 0. I'll predict Harry Kane is going to utterly freeze like a snowman against his former club, and Timus Puki is going to steal a late 1 0 win. Make a note of this. Tottenham nil, Norwich City won. It's going to happen. Anyone who thinks that it's unfathomable that Norwich City will win at Tottenham this weekend have not been paying attention. Just wait. Spurs nil, Norwich won. Ah, why? Why did I say this? Norwich beating Spurs. Dean Smith getting a win over Antonio Conte. D did I drink a glue with my morning frosties? What is this prediction? It's utter horse diarrhea. What was I thinking? Well, you know what? This is my shock prediction of the week. Norwich are unbeaten in four games. They finally got belief breathed back into them by Dean Smith. And I'm going to predict that Billy Gilmore will have a midfield masterclass, making the likes of his Norwich predecessor Oliver Skip look every inch about as creative as a bag of chips. Just stop. Just, 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 just stop talking. Billy Gilmore spent the game gasping for air in the sweaty pocket of Ollie Skip. I mean, he probably hasn't felt this embarrassed since England lost two players at Euro 2020 for tussling his infected hair, but a moment of silence for everybody who's continued to persist with Harry Kane and their fancy league teams until Christmas. I mean, it's probably crippled your team beyond belief. Just a giant 12.0 lump of candle wax rotting up front. I mean, here's a stat for you. A full Tottenham home crowd haven't been able to witness a Harry Kane Premier League goal at their stadium live in the flesh since a day after Christmas Day in 2019. I'm sorry, what? That's nearly two years. Two years without winning a Kane goal in this stadium. What is this? Why is he continuing to play like a giant block of Lego? I mean, do you think Man City are still gonna buy you for 100 million pounds when you're showing the goal scoring ability of a one-legged Barbie doll? Honestly, is this Harry Kane up front or a fat Britney Spears? Kane, you've got one more chance. Liverpool on the 19th of December. That is your last chance to squeak a goal at home. Or else it will be officially two calendar years since a full Tottenham crowd have been able to cheer your Premier League goal live in the flesh. You cannot let that happen. It is an utterly revolting stat. Man United won Crystal Palace nil. So the Ralph Rannick era is up and running with a 1-0 home win over Crystal Palace. Listen, it was a 4-2-2-2 formation. A brilliant, great performances from like Diogo Delo, Victor Lindelof, and Fred. I always said there was a player in here. Pep Guardiola didn't scout him for nothing, but yeah, a pretty easy 1-0 win for Man United. But yeah, up and running. 
Good win. As of Villa 2, Leicester 1. Who can see two goals to Esri Kunsa? I thought it was laughable, but trust me, lads. Leicester usually bottle their late season form under Brendan Rodgers, right? But usually because their early form was so good. All that really meant was they just slipped out of the top four still qualified for Europe in fifth. It, it was still fine. But lads, we're in December and Leicester's early form has them 10th in the league. Just nine points from the drop zone. They, they can't afford another collapse. If they do fall off a cliff, then Leicester are going to wind up in a relegation battle. I mean, here's my prediction. After watching that, as Leicester's search for a clean sheet reached 113 days, yes, a third of the year that I'm calling it, Brendan Rodgers will be sacked before May. Anyway, that's the videos. Let me know what do you think. All right, let me know in the comments if you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, I'll talk to you in a while.